<laughs> okay, so this discussion only works if we have a discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that you guys have to ask questions at some point and engage our panelists in a discussion. We ha um, are going to ask them to give a few minutes of kind of off the cuff remarks about about the topics that they have been assigned. Um, and I think they, we can divide this into drugs and, um, and vaccines. And actually, Salman, I realize that you are the person here who, um, who has not been introduced. Uh, so, so actually, um, let me introduce Salman Keshavi, who is, um, uh, I'm guessing here, at the Department of Global Health at the Medical School, um, and <laughs> was a former chair of the Greenlight Committee and is a really, um, I think, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say the world's expert, although, uh, <laughs> um, on um, trying to treat MDRT better and why we're failing at an operational level in the treatment of MDRT. Is that, is that fair? I wouldn't say I'm a world expert, but I do work. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, and so we've asked Dick and Salman to talk about drugs and essentially, uh, priorities, in clinical trial, well, I, I might be supposing what you're going to talk about. Um, but so why don't we just start with Dick with your remarks on uh, clinical trials and interventions in TB and HIV. And, and we'll have, I think, everybody give their first their comments and then we'll ask questions. That's OK, well, I'll be brief. Um, <coughs> can I have the first slide, please? I'm just kidding, Sarah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that uh, came up in a coffee break yesterday, uh, it obviously isn't, isn't news, but it was a great discussion uh, with uh, the, the man named after the mouse, uh, as Tom Evans said, with Igor uh, Kramnik, uh, is the importance of the animal models. And uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, you know, everything we do in clinical trials is based on what we see in animal models, and having better animal models and refining the animal models is really important. Um, so, so I think that's a, a priority. So it's a priority that's uh, shared pretty much across this entire room because if you, whether you're a basic scientist or a clinician or a, an epidemiologist, um, animal models are going to be uh, essential. Um, biomarkers uh, are essential for clinical <coughs> trials on the prevention side. Um, as, as Stefan said yesterday, uh, <clears throat> knowing who the people who are more likely to progress to disease are uh, is essential, both in terms of designing a clinical trial, but also uh, subsequently for targeting them for treatment, you know, under, under programmatic uh, conditions. So uh, that's important. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, use of, of uh, surrogate markers in, in clinical trials is essential, and I mentioned all the phase two studies rely on uh, surrogate markers, and uh, <clears throat> they're not at all perfected, and so improving uh, those, those markers is uh, essential. And then the whole um, process of designing clinical trials is uh, very difficult, and Tom talked about that nicely with the vaccine studies, but in, in um, uh, drug studies, deciding you know, what you're going to take into a phase two study, what you're going to take to phase three is really uh, difficult, and uh, once you make the commitment, it's extraordinarily expensive. Uh, tens of millions of dollars to do phase three studies of uh, TB drugs. So um, <clears throat> having adaptive trial designs, uh, for instance, uh, and, and doing things like you're doing, Tom, in the vaccine world of, you know, um, do, doing studies where you can throw out the losers um, early on uh, and say, you know, if it doesn't perform well uh, at, at a, you know, at not a 0.05 level, um, but, uh, you know, at a, at a higher level, if it doesn't perform well, we don't want to risk investing in it um, and, and uh, tossing it out. So, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, a real challenge in, uh, in drug development is the fact that when we treat patients for TB, we use multiple drugs, but almost every trial to date has been based on a single new agent being added. So for instance, bedaquiline was approved uh, at the end of uh, 2012 and uh, delaminid was approved in Europe a couple of months ago, and they've never been given together in a clinical study. <clears throat> Nobody knows what will happen when you combine them. Uh, and Cure. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> what, will, what will happen to the uh, to the, the QT? You know, how many people are, <laughs> stays the same? I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with that EKG. <laughs> so so um, you know, studying uh, regimens is is really essential. But uh, you know, the regulatory environment is such that studying regimens is very challenging, and and that needs to. To, to change, and it, it is changing, but it's it's important. So that's all I'll, I'll say about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think we'll have everybody give a few remarks and then maybe pepper you all with questions. <coughs> so Salman was asked to uh, talk about overcoming bottlenecks and uh, okay. access, uh, drug access. I didn't turn it on. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I should just shout. I think it's better. Um, Bottlenecks and drug access for TV and HIV. Thanks, Sarah. I, I've got a really bad cough, and I'm worried that Dick and Jerry will want some urine. <laughs> 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 Hopefully. So I, you know, as I looked at the different uh, panels and I saw my my topic, I thought, you know, it's very interesting because I think uh, the organizers have really thought about how about translation because here we're thinking about how to translate from the bench. To the bedside, and then when you take it from the bedside, how are you actually going to get it delivered in the communities? And I think that's where we have to start to think about um, overcoming bottlenecks to access to drugs, you know, both for TB and HIV. So um, I, I want to—I I think this is a complex topic because it's actually not so much about uh, drugs per se. You know, we know globally that TB rates are not dropping. We just saw that earlier. Uh, the, the rates are, are dropping at around 2% per year. We know that multi-drug resistant TB uh, is increasing. In fact, if you look at data from the WHO, it doesn't look like it's increasing much, but if you actually look at data in the literature, scientific literature, it is increasing quite a bit more. It seems to be increasing quite a bit more. You look at data that's published by countries, like Russia, for example, who present, uh, you know, who show that MDR-TB has gone up from 10 to 30% in the last, in the last uh, decade. Uh, of all cases in, in <coughs> Russia, um, you look at the data from Belarus, Belarus etc. So you you know you are seeing these pockets where drug resistance is going up, and people are recognizing this as a challenge. We're also seeing something interesting, and that's that the spectrum of resistance is going up. So you know you again same data from these countries, uh, data from Mumbai. From, uh, many of you know Hinduja Hospital. Um, uh, Savir spoke in this very conference, I think last year or the year before. Uh, you know, they, they've shown that uh, their fluoroquinolone resistance has gone up from, I think it was about 10% uh, of patients to 55% of patients uh, that, that have MDR. So, you know, the, the, the data are showing that it's becoming a much scarier situation. And those of us that have been working on drug supply issues and access issues and, 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 and improving clinical outcomes have always been working under the assumption that the DOTS strategy uh, from WHO has dealt with the issue of first-line drugs, and really all we needed to do was try to make sure that second-line drugs were available, that, you know, that people would get them and that they would get the, the correct treatment. So I've spent a number of years focusing on MDR-TB drugs, and you know, the first target obviously was that the second-line drugs, which are off patent, were expensive for some reason. And it was thought that there weren't enough people taking these drugs, there was a uh, supply side, uh, uh, there, there was a demand problem, and so, you know, if we actually got more people on treatment, or we bought more, or we did some sort of group, some sort of pool procurement, the prices would go down. And it's 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 kind of you know we focused on price for the last ten or twelve years, if you can believe, or fifteen years, and uh, it turns out that pool procurement was never happening, things like that were never happening, drug orders were being done individually, so those things got streamlined, and, and prices did drop, but it still costs over five thousand dollars per patient. Uh, for treatment, and so people said, "Well, this is more than the, you know the per capita GDP of so many countries. And if you really want to stop this epidemic and get drugs to patients, you're going to have to you know really spend time addressing these these market dynamic problems." Well, it's interesting. The Global Fund came to the uh, uh, came to the fore in, in around 2003, 2004. Started providing money to many countries, many poor countries, for MDRTB drugs. So their effective price went down to zero dollars, right? Somebody else was paying it. So the effective price of the drug went down to zero dollars for these countries. So you would imagine in a supply and demand situation, the demand would skyrocket. It would, it would go to exactly the number of patients that they're finding with MDRTB. 
Turned out it didn't. Turns out that even last year, countries like Indonesia and countries like Nigeria returned 40 and 30 million dollars respectively to the global funds. Couldn't spend it. So it starts, you start to say, wow, this is a very complex problem. It's really not, this, this delivery problem is actually, it does involve markets and it should involve markets, but it actually doesn't. And for everyone in this room that's, that's thinking about uh, you know, uh, protein targets and vaccines and stuff, this becomes relevant. Because that means that there's something else out there that's stopping people from getting treatment uh, for TB. So we, you know, so those of us that were looking at this said, well, okay, so there's something, uh, there's something wrong with, 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 with this, the market dynamics. And when we look at what's happening in countries, you heard yesterday from Rocio and Anne, from their data from Ethiopia, they, they've got an 80% cure rate. In Tomsk, where our group works, in the prisons, we had an 82% cure rate for MDRTB using second line drugs in patients with very advanced disease. And yet, if you look at the data from countries around the world, about a number of them have cure rates below 50%. Romania has a cure rate under 20%, which is basically, is you're better off sending people to the mountains with a food pack or something, right? <laughs> I mean, under 20%, it's really, it's, it's pre-sanatorium uh, level. So, uh, you then start to say, well, there's definitely a problem, uh, there's definitely a problem with our ability to actually deliver care, and there's a delivery gap. Dick mentioned new drugs. Bedaquin, first new drug in 40 years. I, I mean, last I heard, I, I'm not kidding, I think they've sold 12 bottles or something. It's not a lot. The first new drug, you think that, you know, with so many people dying, 500,000 MDRTB cases a year, 120,000 deaths, they shouldn't be able to keep this on the shelf. People should be demanding lower prices. They can't even sell it. So it's, it's there, you know, there's, for people who are making new technologies in this room, this becomes a very relevant problem. So, you know, there's an implementation gap, there's reasons for it that we have to think about the complexity of treatment, you know, weakness of health systems, uh, you know, et cetera. So those of us that focused on MDRTB for a long time then said, wow, you know, there's something, maybe if we start looking at this whole paradigm in general, there's an even bigger problem. And so, you know, our group at the, the Department of, of Global Health and Social Medicine started looking at the situation with regular sort of TB, and you saw from the data presented yesterday, the number of kids is double what was expected. The number of cases of regular TB that are ignored by the current DOT system are very, uh, are, are, are very, you know, very high. When you start looking at drug supply issues in this area, you find out that not only are, uh, does the WHO system only service about 12 to 15 percent of first-line drugs, but there are very few pediatric formulations available. Uh, uh, just only for a, a few of the drugs and not in enough su supply. We find out that we're only diagnosing 60% of the cases globally, best estimates. And still there's supply issues. Many of you know there's an eyes and eyes and shortage even in the United States. So there's supply issues even for the paltry number of people that we actually do find. So if we actually were to do the standard of care, active case finding in poor countries, we would face a major problem, a major shortage, even with first line drugs. The other th issue is, as you know, we don't do the standard of care in poor countries. We don't treat latent TB disease. Jerry just presented these great slides, and you see that latent TB is an issue. It's a spectrum. It's important. It's a ticking time bomb. There's no disease in history that where you've ignored the latent phase, it just disappears. Obviously, it's impossible, unless you have a vaccine. And that, that addresses it. So when you think about this, we have not addressed this. And if we were to address it, even on a small level, if we were to say, Wow, why don't we treat all the people with HIV for their latent disease? Why don't we treat people with diabetes, people with COPD, people with silicosis? Whatever you know, criteria you use to start, we don't have enough drugs for that. So I think that you know, moving forward, we part of part of as as we're taking things from the bench to the delivering communities, we actually have to be thinking about uh, our systems. You know, better ways of pool procurement at a, at a bare minimum, whether it's going to be uh, new drugs, vaccines, etc. We have to think about delivery. You know, countries have to, many countries just follow algorithms. You bring in a new drug, if it's not directly in the algorithm and people are not trained to use it, it doesn't happen. You bring in a new vaccine, like the Dardar trial type vaccine, where you have to go five times. You need surveillance systems to know who to give it to. You need to be able to follow people up. You need to be able to 
you need to be able to find them for their, for their remaining doses. And we know in poor countries this is a problem even with things like the hepatitis vaccine. Uh, and then we have to think about engagement with the private sector. Our entire global system of distribution for TB focuses on public sectors, many of which should be strengthened and can be strengthened, but there are also private sectors in these countries. And people say, oh, private sector is just horrible, so you know, we don't work with them. They actually need to be trained, needs to be developed, they need to be monitored, and they can be used as delivery arms for for these drugs. So I think the problem of drugs, you know, when you're thinking about how do we change the tide, tide what knowledge are we lacking, it becomes very complex in the systems that we're, we're lacking knowledge of systems and how to actually uh, improve them to make sure that the fruits of what people are doing here gets to the recipients. Thank you. Okay, we made it. Thank you. We made an executive decision that we should pause for questions. Um, Actually, contrasting the discussions about why we are so pitiful of actually getting things done on the ground uh, with the research agenda, um, and and open those, and I'll, and I'll start just by asking a question: um, Do you think that the basic science research agenda should be focused around um, with an implementation view in mind? So things like a vaccine that you would have to administer five times, you would just cut immediately because implementation, because of the implementation cost inherent in that. Well, the, that specific question really isn't a basic science question. So should the basic science question be constrained? Uh, uh, should the basic science approach be constrained? And I would say no, because who knows what basic science is going to uh, deliver. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, there, a translational science question, okay. I guess. So, should, should, I mean, uh, um, the translational I think, research agenda. I think that uh, people in that field um, should pay attention to the opening paragraph <coughs> of their R01, where they explain why it's so important. But beyond that, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you try to justify what you're doing because you want to have a downstream impact on people. So, so we won't. We won't support any vaccine that's given more than three times. So our our stage gate criteria, if you look on our website or anything. So we told the Dartmouth group, if you want to develop this, you need to show that you can give it three times and other workers could decide because we think three times is the maximum amount of times that it can be given and potentially be effective. So from a translational point of view, yeah. We, we do think that you have to take those considerations in for that, but I agree with that. I think at a basic science point of view, you shouldn't do it. You should have like almost zero constraints That's basic science. But can I just turn this around for a sec? Because I actually think that you're, you're, you're asking a good question, Sarah. I actually think the, the opposite <laughs> should happen. What's happened with the TB community, our current approach to delivery has been shaped by selective primary health care. Can we do something that's very simple? easy, that can be done without any health expertise, and that's a one-size-fits-all. And we're seeing, even from the slides that Andy just showed, that, uh, sorry, Jerry just showed, that the, the uh, uh, even, even something like LTBI is so much more complex. There's, things are happening in a spectrum. There is no one-size-fits-all. And we've, we've approached this disease in a way that's very different than any other infection we do. We would never do this with Staph aureus or Klebsiella. It would seem ridiculous if you said we're just going to do one thing and not test for it. And, you know, it would just seem completely crazy. And so I think what we have to recognize is that the complexity that's coming out of the scientific world needs to be reflected in how we're building structures to deliver care in communities. And maybe in a country like India, which is actually putting people in space and sending up intercontinental ballistic missiles, we can do LTBI treatment. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> right? If you can land an airplane in Uganda, you can probably uh, do some screening, right? Because airplanes are complex beasts. So, you know, the, I, I'm thinking that, that we just have to re change around how we're viewing the delivery part to match the science more than the science being limited by us. You know, so uh, we did a study in Uganda in the 1990s, post-1997, showing that uh, preventive therapy had some efficacy and 
as of now, we're finally implementing preventive therapy in Uganda. I mean, we're not the ministry is. They, they have been negative up until this point, uh, saying that they're concerned about screening and osmosis resistance. So the 20 year or something, uh, 15, 16, 17 year gap between an FT study that's completed and some type of implementation. And we recently did a study published in 2010 looking at uh, prevalence of MDR TB on the TB board, and it was 12% in retreatment cases. And it, it created a lot of alarm, but even as of today, Uganda is finally getting into gear uh, to begin to treat patients with MDR TB, much less successfully than Rwanda has been in this regard. In fact, many Ugandan patients could go to Rwanda and be treated. So the question I have for you, or both of you actually, is as scientists and investigators, it's easy for us to do a trial and to assume that once it's published, action will be taken. But do we have a role, and should we have a voice, given that we're dealing with disenfranchised populations that don't have their own voice? I would say the short answer is yes, because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're um, if, we, if we even look at HIV in Africa, and I want to take the example of single-dose nevirapine to mothers, everyone said, we knew that, that that was not the right practice from the, from the experience in the United States. It was documented, it was in manuals, et cetera. We were still doing it in many African countries for a number of years, and people said, well, it's better than nothing. Uh, the fact that it was contributing to drug resistance in these women, you know, was just pushed aside. And then eventually the standard of care caught up. And so that's, you know, that's just a classic example. Could we not use the data that were available? MDRTB, we had guidelines in 1992. They only became global guidelines in 2006. So I think that, you know, these are areas where we need to say what the HIV community said when it came to offering HIV care to poor countries that people there are not different species, that the research that we're finding that has a bearing on our own practice needs to translate. And this whole idea of local standards of care is actually hogwash, because in actual fact, people don't have high standards of care because they actually don't have systems in place to, to ensure them. So I think I, I, I agree with you, Jerry, that we, we, we do have to have that. Uh, we have to be the advocates. I approach it from a, a slightly different perspective and say that uh, in doing uh, clinical interventions, um, it's important to uh, you know, start <coughs> off with the uh, policymakers and start off with the public health system and have them engage from the outset <coughs> in framing the question that you're going to answer. Because it's very informative. You know, mm -hmm. when you go to Uganda to de design a study in the 1990s, or if I went to Haiti in the 1990s to design a similar study, you know, uh, we didn't engage that much, at least we didn't engage much with, uh, with the Ministry of Health. We did engage, but we didn't, they weren't true partners. And, you know, um, as a result, the results, uh, you know, the outcome of the study wasn't implemented for, you know, for quite some time. There are obviously other reasons in Haiti, like not having a functioning government for a long time. But um, uh, with our CREATE consortium, you know, we took the opposite approach where we brought the, the, the ministries and the local health departments and the policymakers in at the outset, said help us design the studies, help us ask the questions that will give you answers that you will then act on. Um, and I think even when you do it that way, it's difficult to implement, it's difficult to deliver because there are so many different challenges that you don't anticipate. But it's better than thinking that a New England Journal paper is going to change the world. Uh, because New England Journal papers are great, but they don't change the world. You know, uh, changing the world requires a lot of other activities with policymakers and health uh, ministries. Um, and, and if they're engaged from the outset and have a stake in what the outcome is going to be, then uh, it's much more likely to be translated into, you know, um, into action. Um, a few years ago, I heard a presentation on of a project uh, to improve maternal delivery in, in Africa, funded by a major um, nonprofit. And um, what they were having difficulty with was getting um, the, the raw data back from the collection stations uh, to prove their point. And 
the issue was, I guess it never really got down to saying all of these people who were busy delivering the babies and taking care of the mothers and so on, um, what tools have we given them to easily collect the data that's needed? And if you don't study that and then understand these people and what they're trying to do, when they're under pressure, well, you know what goes first. I mean, the data is just either not going to be done or in a way. And we have tools, so we have to really work with people who are the people applying the bandages and educate them and work with them uh, in a very, very supportive way. And you will bring them around. I think that's a great point. And there's nothing uh, more horrifying than to go out and look at clinic registers. You know, these big, huge books that fill up a table that people are sitting down and wasting all this time, you know, hand entering data that then someone else is going to, you know, have to copy into another book and take to a district and 10% yeah, I mean, incorrect. so I, I agree that, uh, that monitoring and, and uh, collection of surveillance data and, and implementation data is so tedious. <coughs> and I just think about myself when I'm in clinic at Hopkins, you know, you know, what's the first thing that, that goes, you know, when I'm busy? I don't do any of this stupid paperwork that they want me to do, you know, and then months later they say, you forgot to bill. And I say, ah, so what? I don't care, you know. So <laughs> your inclination is you want to take care of your patient. You don't want to fill out forms. And, you know, the form filling in, in many countries is just horrifying. Graham. I think it's a, a, a specific uh, treatment question. Um, a, a substantial portion of the mortality uh, in Africa related to HIV TB occurs in, in patients um, who often have bacteremia with TB, about one third of them, most of them have disseminated TB, uh, and mortality accrues very early within the first week of, of starting TB treatment, despite all the intervention that we have. And my question is, is could we improve on our TB treatment strategies for those specific patients? Um, and the way we conduct TB treatment trials currently, are we addressing that population group by looking at the sputum? And the sputum over an eight week period, when actually what they need is, is better acute interventions of their TB. Yeah, I, well, so Jerry just showed the LAM data, and you know, uh, it's, it, that's really, a, uh, I think, a game changer in that setting for hospitalized patients. You know, at, at uh, Chris Hani Baraguana in, in Soweto, there are 7,000 7, admissions a year for tuberculosis and 22% inpatient mortality. And, and none of those cases are reported. So they don't count towards the total of TB uh, uh, cases or deaths in South Africa. Um, mm. So it's just stunning. Um, How come and they're not reported? Because you get reported when you get put on treatment. You don't get reported uh, you know, if you're not in the program. And if you come into the hospital and die, you're not on the program. So that's, that's how surveillance works. So it misses all those deaths. Um, so, so I think rapid diagnosis with a bedside uh, urine dipstick, you know, in that setting can identify 60 to 70 percent of the people who have TB. Then an expert will bring that up to almost 90 percent. So, um, uh, so initiating treatment early. But, I mean, the real answer there isn't better clinical trials. The real answer there is preventing those people from ever coming to the hospital dying of tuberculosis. Early so preventing tuberculosis in the first place uh, and getting earlier HIV diagnosis, getting people on antiretroviral therapy. I don't think you can design a study or should design a study to try to avoid 22% mortality in people admitted to the hospital dying. You have to have a better strategy of they shouldn't ever come to the hospital dying. The interventions have to <clears throat> occur previously to be really effective. But um, I do think um, the hope for people in that situation is the, is the, the dipstick. Can I, can I just take issue with that? I mean, because I mean, even the health system strengthening is going to take a long time, and, and these patients with disseminated TB in a hospitalized setting are probably going to keep coming because of weak health systems. And I mean, given that they have an acute bacteremic illness, shouldn't we be looking at, at the question of whether our current TB treatment strategies, which are based largely on outpatient 
clinical trials uh, are appropriate for those patients where they're higher doses, intravenous DB treatment, et cetera, is, is not more appropriate? Well, I, I guess, well, I guess I'll turn that around. So what's the study you want to do? I mean, if you would you want to give high-dose rifapentine, I'd be all for it. Do you want to add moxifloxacin? You know, I'd be all for that as well. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't know how to design a study to address that question. I mean, do you want to do some kind of immunotherapy? Do you want to... There, there are lots of potential things you yeah. could think of. I, I think the three broad, con three broad contexts, uh, concepts are uh, intravenous treatment, seeing it's, it's a bacteremic illness and yeah. with variable catch absorption, high doses, and then immunotherapy. Uh, with the assumption that these patients have more immune failure as a result of their, their, their bacteremia um, added to their uh, HIV immune suppression. And, and <laughs> well, I think I, I think one area where there's a, a real need for that, and there's already been some evidence that that it's important, is with TB meningitis, both in children and in adults, but particularly in children, and 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 doing intravenous therapy and giving very high doses of rifamycin and adding moxifloxacin, I think, uh, has already been shown in one study to improve outcomes, and that's a setting you know, where I think that's important and valuable. Um, whether that is necessary or, or would have an effect in um, bacteremic disease, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's certainly something that could be studied. So, yeah. Shall we, why don't we, um, why don't we transition actually to the next, to adding vaccines to this discussion? And, um, and Steve, I think you're up next in terms okay. of priorities for vaccine and diagnostic development for TB and HIV. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, so a lot of great points have been made. I think um, I agree with Jerry that well, certainly Tom must feel this way because he's doing it. I think the optimism is uh, justified. And I can just think back for 20 years, we thought, wow, what are we going to do? And 10 years ago, we thought, well, maybe we're getting somewhere. But um, there's a great pipeline now. And I think we're starting to begin to understand how to use vaccines. I'm a little surprised at your comment, Tom, however. Um, Let's just think about it a minute. The, sometimes the, the uh, perfection is the enemy of the good, as we just talked about. I mean, let's say you have a vaccine that, doesn't, that needs more than three doses or so on and so forth. I mean, what we're trying to do is perhaps change how we're testing vaccines now and, you know, how they're used. And these models don't necessarily <coughs> predict that very well. But I understand what you're saying, that you've got to have something that's practical and feasible. <coughs> so what I've learned from this uh, discussion, or at least what I'd like to make a point of, is that um, we have to consider <coughs> a lot of aspects when we're talking about TB and HIV. We didn't really get into the whole system of, uh, or those idea of adjuvants, and uh, although Tom mentioned several of these vaccine candidates are out there, uh, contain protein adjuvants, but, you know, now we have this complexity, and there'll be a review coming out soon from, from uh, Bob Gallo's group, of their data in monkeys, how adjuvants can actually increase infect, infection of certain CD4 cell types. And those of us, you know, we're, we're, they, they come to us and they say, well, what we want is long-term memory responses against HIV, but please don't activate our T cells. Um, okay, so if we know what to look for, we know what to assay, maybe we can address that challenge. But it's different than what we've been doing in the past. Um, and the talk on formulation today was incredible because you really need to formulate your adjuvant molecules in the right way to be able to use less of them and maybe avoid some of these uh, activation aspects. So we haven't even begun to address that. How safe are TB vaccines in uh, HIV populations and how to avoid, as we will have to do in HIV vaccines, how to avoid excessive, uh, well, perhaps generating more host cells uh, through T cell activation. Um, but. I just want to mention one thing. Somebody mentioned the animal models uh, earlier, Dick, I think. I'm, um, I think we used animal models incorrectly for a long time in TB. But having said that, I think they've taught us a lot and they've given us an indication of what to move forward with. And the reason I say that is based largely on uh, the nature of the immune response that we're getting in a mouse correlates to what we see in the clinic now, at least with the adjuvants that we're testing um, in terms of quality of immune response. 
we don't have cordless yet in, in, in TB, but I think we're getting um, I think we're getting some consistency among the animal models and the um, the monkey model has taught us a lot, especially about safety. So I think uh, we can we can take a lot of that home. But I also want to make a point when people are developing vaccines. What we've learned in the last few years is that at least I've been wasting a lot of time using way too much antigen and getting way too much T cell activation. And as we found out, and Peter Anderson found out, this, the lower you go in your antigen dose, the better your response is. This is contrary to everybody that I talk to in the HIV field or the herpes field. Oh, let's use more antigen because that last dose didn't work well. We have to start thinking a little more intelligently, especially when we're combining these with adjuvants. And it's so exciting because that'll drop down the cost of goods tremendously as well. Um, not tremendously, but at least these recombinant proteins, they need to be used correctly. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. Before we kill a vaccine candidate, let's say you have an antigen that looked promising in an animal model. Um, you know, an antigen can't be evaluated very effectively unless you've got a way to deliver it that you believe in and that works. And so we've, I think, not been able to evaluate a lot of antigens because we haven't had the, the best adjuvant delivery systems. And so it's a, it's a two-phase approach. You've really got to select the adjuvant that you're going to use with, uh, before you do a lot of antigen screening. The, um, then the other thing I was going to talk about yesterday, but I just I didn't have time. The, the way we select antigens has changed somewhat. We all used to look at immunodominant antigens, but as Tom pointed out, some of these fusion proteins have a combination of subdominant and dominant, and it turns out that the organism has used uh, a lot of tricks over, the, over its evolution, and you can induce a very strong immune response and very solid protection in animals, at least with subdominant antigens that are hardly recognized at all by people. So even though it's been great for NIH grants to say that you're going to select the antigens based on T cell responses in healthy PPD positive individuals, well, maybe that's not quite the way uh, we need to do things when we when we get to the uh, to the vaccine development. But, but finally, I think the most important thing, and I learned this from Lishmaniasis, um, is that you know we all are very naive when we start out <coughs> trying to make a vaccine. We don't think about how we're going to test it, and uh, these prophylactic intervention studies of 100,000 people are impossible. So having a post-exposure prophylaxis uh, uh, system or having a targeted population that we can rapidly get a result, that's, that's to me the most exciting part about the whole thing. Um, and I sure hope it works, and I hope, I call that a prime boost, that the infection is actually the prime, and I'm hoping that's true, that it's a prime that's a relevant one to a protective immune response, but we'll have to wait and see. But it has turned out to be that way in, in uh, some of the preclinical studies. And then lastly, I'm very excited about being on the panel with some, uh, you know, or being in a, an audience that talks about chemotherapy because I think that host targets and bacterial targets uh, need to be combined in something, and they haven't been. In cancer, that's where, where we're going. I mean, great, you get 30% response with uh, checkpoint inhibitors in a cancer study, but what if companies got together and combined that with, a, you know, activation? That's what Ralph Steinman always said he needed to have given to him. I mean, let's activate these CD4 cells that give them more cd 8 And I think in the TB community, as Tom said, people do work pretty well together. Let's get these drugs and combine them with some of the adjuvants or some of the um, uh, host uh, target modulators to improve on the um, to improve on the on the efficacy. Just as we're thinking about doing with therapy with vaccine therapy, we would ne never use a vaccine alone. I don't think to treat. TB, but we'd use it in combination with drugs. So uh, it's a very exciting time. But more and more, we have to evaluate these vaccines in, a, in models in a way that we're going to use them. Very few of us have actually modeled what, what Tom wants to do in South Africa now, which is prevent progression or reinfection or re Very few of us have modeled our vaccines in an already in infected animal. Um, but, you know, with what with what um, Stefan talked about, the recombinant BCG, and with what we do, these approaches can be combined, and they can be combined, um, you know, uh, maybe in a therapeutic setting with drug in the future. So there's a lot of tools on the, on the horizon. So um, it's hard to go last because. Uh, well, he'll always have but, something. But I'm sure you, <laughs> Stefan, will have something to say. Yes. So how do we conclude? with um, the priorities for basic research and vaccine development and then open it back up for discussion.
may be hard, but uh, it's also, I can be short. Uh, so first of all, this was a great meeting. Um, I think um, basic research is in the vaccine field is actually at a divide, as is vaccine development, actually. Uh, first, I think we have basic research should now be ex get excited about samples that come from clinical trials and that come from patients. I think that is the one th um, aspect which I would like to favor, that we should now go reverse translation from the patients, from the vaccinees, back into the lab and then use those samples as good as possible and as scientifically oriented as possible. Um, so what we need would here biorepositories and good sample collection. That may not be in the interest of a single vaccine developer because these samples might help another vaccine candidate, a competitor perhaps even to be improved, but I think it's an, it's an enormous uh, wealth and rich um, resource for future research. And I think again that comes up with the kind of global portfolio in vaccines with ERAS as one of the leaders um, that we really should favor a transparent collection, transparent biorepositories, and then see who can apply for the best possible research done with these samples. <coughs> May not be, as I said before, for the vaccine under trial, maybe for another vaccine or for an improved vaccine, but that's the in one first, first very important point. The second one is what I called very briefly, I think we should um, use the black swan strategy um, that is um, we should hope in the basic research lab that a rare and improbable event has a big potential and they occur apparently if they occur in uh, occur in um, in banking and financing why shouldn't they <laughs> occur every now and then in the lab and forget about the negative results every now and then there may be a great effect in the positive way so I, I tried to collect a few points very briefly, which I think we should uh, focus basic research on. Having in mind, as I said before, all the current vaccination strategies, as diverse as they look like, they're actually quite similar. They all try to stimulate T cells, either in a prime or in a boost, or prime boost, obviously, uh, and then activate T cells and see what comes out. And uh, we all get this one, or sometimes too long, better protection. And that holds true for all vaccines. So the one point actually Steve already mentioned, that is, are we looking for the right antigens? Um, I'm not fully convinced that this paper of Sebastian uh, Garnier and Joel Ernes for the experts is, um, I would follow the whole conclusion from that, but at least it stimulates the idea that um, those antigens which we use are conserved. Conserved antigens may be conserved because they are to the benefit of the pathogen, and we might look into um, different antigens, and as you mentioned, Steve, uh, subdominant antigens, variable antigens might be at least an interesting source to look at and uh, might be uh, giving us new ideas. I also mentioned the antibodies. I'm still eager to see preventive antibodies, and I think that we can learn a lot from the HIV field in that respect, with the broadly neutralizing antibodies. Perhaps it's not directly the same, but perhaps there is an issue that we have overseen that there are some hidden epitopes for antibodies in MTB that might be useful to touch upon. For me, an antibody that um, should be considered should have fulfilled two criteria. First, it should ideally inhab inhibit the Pathogen. We won't have this neutralizing or prevention of invasion because macrophages might eat them up anyway. Uh, but still, they could, for example, prevent their iron uptake and then kind of dry them out in a way. And second, of course, they should facilitate uptake into the right host cells. And the host cells, although I think that's not a model for uh, clinical trials in the lab, of course, could be kind of improved, the factor cells, and we come to that in a minute with the HDTs, the host-directed therapies, which Igor and um, Dan and also Steve mentioned. Um, I would think we should go for the innate lymphoid cells. I personally have ignored them perhaps too long. Also, I was once in the so-called unconventional T-cell area with gamma delta T-cells, CD1-restricted T-cells. The mate, the mucosa-associated immune T-cells might be interesting targets to look at more precisely how can we stimulate those in addition to the conventional T cells, which I would not at all uh, um, eliminate in my thinking. And then we come to this kind 
of host directed therapy. That's two levels. First, intercommunication should be kind of better control T Rex cells and other inhibitory immune mechanisms, including IL 10, IL 4, TH2 like effects. And second, of course, can we learn from the cancer field? Can we learn from the um, from the HIV field and can we learn how to improve or re-establish full activity in a macrophage that is or any other effector cell, Igor mentioned that um, today, a T cell is not better than its effector. If you need an effector cell like a macrophage, the best T cell can't activate a silent or a suppressed macrophage obviously, so you revert that, you revert it perhaps with uh, molecules like then Kalman described it with one, um, with Kleeweg as one example, inhibit or reverse, revitalize uh, kinase, side, uh, kinase signaling cascades to get better responses. I'm well aware that I have this privilege to talk about research, not thinking how that will all work out uh, <laughs> later, but I, I think about it and uh, we discussed that just in the break, actually how to get two or three compounds that are not licensed, approved directly in one clinical trial. That's not my business, but I think we should all work on that, that we get more than one and drugs already have that. I thought the TB Alliance has several drugs which have not been yeah. approved in one trial. Um, so we should think about that and try to get the regulatory agencies, but that's not the topic of my discussion today. And finally, probably that, um, I don't know whether this is really discussed that, but that's a very critical thing. But for an experimental animal model, I would also think of um, of rewaking dormant MTB. As I said briefly, I consider dormant MTB as very hard to attack, both by drugs and by, by current drugs and by immune mechanisms. Could we go the kind of, with all its implications of, uh, this is a dangerous approach, but we're talking about animal models, can we rewake re it into an active stage and then hit it hard with a good immune response and that might be something also for the drug approach uh, whether it works or not I'm not sure and I'm sure that you will never get that probably easily never never say never but it will be extremely hard to get that through a regulatory agency <laughs> approval anyway I think that's another aspect that I would like to um, um, look at in more detail and when I say I I don't mean that I do it but someone in the TB field, my <laughs> Actually, I'm considering. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in summary, uh, there is still a, a lot uh, <coughs> um, of interesting aspects that one person considers important. And since science is free, as we say, with our little constraints, ideally, although we're talking about targeted research, not fully basic research, I would say. Uh, if you really do basic research, only few would go into the TB area. It's kind of targeted basic research, but that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is on vaccines and animal models. And uh, Gail had asked a question, I guess, get it low, but about uh, reinfection and, and that rule. And I, I just wanted to bring it up again, not in a negative way, because I think that. Uh, Tom has addressed it, um, but um, I think there, what's lacking now is an animal model that incorporates reinfection. Um, we see it in our natural transmission model, but there are, it's, it's not the easiest one. And I'm trying to think what would be between the current animal models where you uh, inoculate or insufflate uh, 30 to 50 colony forming units all at once and, and kind of model we see where random uh, infections occur over weeks or months. And it seems to me that it, there could be developed a low dose, really low dose aerosol chronic exposure model where you could still pick the strains you want. You won't get the animal, uh, the organisms that are not been in culture, but at least you could replicate uh, a repeated exposure kind of situation over weeks or months. I would think, and it might tell us something about uh, whether, and I think the point, you know, lowering the threshold or raising the threshold for uh, reinfection could be an alternative goal, and the only way you're going to study that is to have a model where you could have reinfection built in. Well, I, I think investing in those things is very important. I, I think the reason I have optimism in the TB vaccine now is because of long, Term studies 
that we did with GSK and monkeys and we've done guinea pigs that go out a year and a half. And there you can really show long-term protection that's superior to BCG. It's not the same thing you're talking about, but it's an investment in a very expensive situation because you have to keep animals around for 18 months or two years in the case of the monkeys. But um, I believe that those investments are worth it because they're going to save you time and uh, money in the, in the field in the long run. I also agree. I think that's a good example of where I would start really this reverse translation. Go into patients where you assume they have been reinfected, go into vaccinees of a long-term trial where you learn how the vaccine behaves in the um, um, reinfection human situation. And then I would think go back into the animals. There's no restriction to go immediately, but I think there's also big room in that part for global analysis for samples, and that's why you need those samples and um, then analyze them uh, appropriately. So I think that's a good part also where the animal experiment could then benefit from the human uh, material and analysis. Uh, well, um, I'm a cryptographer who's been a microbiologist postdoc for two months, so please excuse my ignorance. Uh, but given the relapse and the reinfection rates, um, it seems like if you get the full blown disease TB uh, and it's cleared, um, it would seem like that presents all the best of the antigens and the adjuvants, um, but if you can still relapse, um, does that it, it, does that suggest that it's um, a waste of time and energy to look for preventive vaccine? And I was wondering if the best we can hope for is a prophylactic or a relapse vaccine. Um, and given the reinfection rates, uh, would is it real? Can we have one vaccine, or would, it, would the model have to be something like an influenza vaccine, where you have to come up with a new one every year or every few years in case of TB? Well, first, clearly, I, I would, what was said before, there's not one solution for everything at that, uh, at that stage. I think there's clearly a, a preventive vaccine that may not be the same as a kind of therapeutic vaccine, maybe, but that's unlikely in my personal opinion. So there are clearly different vaccines. And as I said, I mean, that's, that's where basic research, I would suggest, goes into you know, vaccines that can even prevent infection and then therefore transmission and disease. And, um, or sterile eradication. That's the wrong way to go. That's the feed for the basic research. But uh, we agree we are not there, for sure. Well, there's a couple of things. We may never be able to control all the host factors that can be involved in relapse. But in clinical trials, we can. We can do the best we can to make sure that they're not even compromised in other ways. But yeah, I don't, maybe Tom's thought about this. I really haven't. Yeah, there might be a possibility of uh, more than one vaccine, more than one uh, product profile. Maybe one for preventing infection and one for preventing adult relapse, targeted uh, disease, and so on and so forth. One to boost BCG in the primary school and which she children. So it's, it's a good thought. Just having a, a thought, and uh, it's a little bit off the wall possibly, but could you have a public health vaccine that just prevents blocks transmission? And if one of the vaccines does block transmission, would we find that, would we recognize that in the trials that are being done? So it's a really good point in that there may be vaccines, for example, reduce, induce atypical responses, for example, that coat the bacteria that are in the patient to keep them from transmitting. And, and, you, and the answer is we are not studying that at all right now but there is work being looked in natural transmission models at the moment where you could start to do that. The great thing about that, and there have been a couple papers that have been published, is that if you did that, then you, the field trials are actually easier. Because you go to, you basically <coughs> randomize, you know, 50,000 people over here and 50,000 people over there, and then you just look at total rates. And uh, those kinds of trials have been done for a variety of vaccines, and there, that, that, that trial for example, the Rebax trial, which was done in Brazil, which they did 300,000 people, um, are actually easier to do than the trials we're talking about doing, where you're 
very carefully following, say, five or six or 10,000 people. So the problem is we don't have the animal system to test that right now. Can I just comment on what Stefan was saying? I think this goes back to the way we are, uh, you know, we've been viewing this one size fits all approach where chemotherapeutics and immunomodulation and vaccines have been so separate from each other. And I'm just thinking, you know, we, in our TOMS cohort of patients, when we look at the people who fail therapy, their mortality within three years is 80%. So it's, you know, really like an, some advanced cancer if you fail therapy. And people like Marcus Maurer at uh, Karolinska have, you know, have been uh, experiment thinking about immunomodulation and they've, you know, they've experimented with uh, uh, infusion of, of autologous mesenchymal stem cells and, you know, in Belarus and have seen an effect in XDR patients where patient, you know, it's a phase one study but that they published recently in the Lancet uh, Respiratory, but the, uh, you know, they are seeing that it seems that a T cell zeta chain uh, is upregulated. You're seeing some improvement of immune function. You're actually seeing uh, what appears to be less, you know, a regression of fibrosis. And the patients seem to be clearing uh, their TB in the small cohort that they looked at. So it really tells you that maybe that as we're moving forward with chemotherapeutics, especially for groups of people who have had TB for a long time, we may actually want to be tying together some of the immunomodulation, whether via vaccine or mesenchymal stem cells, or you know, however you approach it, but you to actually modulate uh, that. And Bob Wallace, obviously, as you guys probably know, has talked a lot about about uh, using nonspecific TNF alpha inhibitors in a similar uh, setting. Uh, you know, could you actually modulate, as you were suggesting, yeah. could you actually activate it in a certain way and suppress the immune system in a certain way and then hit it really hard? So I think we have to be very creative, and it won't be for the guy who walks in the door with one lesion, but it'll be for somebody along that spectrum. Uh, I want to comment on animal models, of course, and I think that um, I'm very satisfied to see that uh, there's a much more appreciation that uh, sophisticated animal models help than hurt. And that they must be complicated, they must address diversity in human population because no drug regimen or no vaccine will fit all. And I, I think it's uh, pretty clear uh, from uh, a paper uh, that was uh, cited today in and that's for me, it, Paul, Paul and Heldon's paper, where they've shown that people successfully treated from TB had maybe fivefold higher chances to be reinfected than general population. That means that they represent a group of risk. Those people were initially more sensitive for whatever reason they are, comorbidities or genetic reasons. And I think that what we need, what we lack, is that when we look at vaccines or interventions, we don't took into consideration this diversity in the human population. So when Ed said that we need to think about a reinfection model, we try to reproduce some features of the disease that is present in the general human population, we need to integrate diversity of the human population in our strategies uh, as well. And I think that uh, I'm very <coughs> satisfied to, to see that failed clinical trials are very expensive, right? So, sophisticated and a little bit more uh, expensive animal models is still much cheaper than failed clinical trial. So for example, what I just tried to suggest is that, let's say if there's a, an animal model, mouse model of course, with predictable types of lesions uh, that reproduce different type of environments that bacteria face in humans and could be drug tolerant, uh, actively growing bacteria, etc. We can reproduce it in a spectrum of genetically uh, uh, defined animal models based on their uh, uh, makeup. And then we can administer vaccines, pre-exposure, post-exposure. We can administer different drug combinations and see which populations are being targeted efficiently uh, <laughs> by whatever intervention with this and which population is being um, uh, protected by, by the niche. So then we can think how to modify this niche and uh, in enhance efficiency of therapies. So along the slides, I just want to mention that uh, recently we tried to uh, develop uh, screening for um, compounds that would enhance effects of interferon gamma. 
So in HIV patients, you'd expect low numbers of affected T cells producing a different gamma. But also in the granuloma, T cells don't reach the center of a granuloma where most of the bugs are. So always cells, uh, macrophages, that handle the, the, the bugs usually would probably not have as much interferon gamma as you can put in an vitro model. So uh, if those compounds can help macrophages survive better or fight better with uh, a lesser help of T cells, it's kind of another way of addressing the, the issue, not increasing just number of effective T cells and amount of available interferon, but also trying to work on the macrophage side, responder cell, to sensitize them to act action of interferon and try to direct them into a specific kind of uh, effective phase. Because interferon gamma effects are beneficial, but they're very broad. And if your compound have a uh, kind of ability to enhance a specific aspect of interferon gamma uh, for, for a patient, that would be a dream kind of uh, scenario where uh, it can work together with immunotherapy, but also uh, work in optimizing macrophage responses to immunostimulation. Well, I just want to add one thing. I think that animal models need to be more quantitative and more up to speed. Because looking at survival and bacterial counts is like Stone Age. It's 100 year old technologies. And we need to have a much more quantitative techniques based on imaging, based on functional reporters to exactly understand what intervention is doing. And this would allow using interventions for much shorter period of time and be much more quantitative to predict uh, what they might be doing. Okay, since I am a big believer in that last point, I think maybe we should let that be the final point of this discussion yeah. and then <laughs> turn it over to Rocio for a yeah. uh, remark. On behalf of the organizers, um, I hope this has been a fruitful venue for collaboration and innovative thinking. Um, we owe this to the patients present and future and to the families affected by this disease. Thank you, Mark, and the coordinating committee for all your support. I want to personally thank all of the attendants and all of the speakers from home and overseas who have joined us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.